everyone, it's Lacey Skulls from VH1's Rock of Love. And this is Talk of Love, the new podcast. This isn't just reality, this is real life. Hey everyone, it's Lacey motherfucking Skulls. And this is Talk of Love episode 30. Can you believe it's been 30 episodes? It's crazy, time goes by so fast. So you guys know that two of my favorite topics, two things that I love to talk about, I can talk for hours about, animals and music. And today I want to talk to you guys about music and in particular a band and even more specifically an artist that I'm a really big fan of. uh, I want to get into for a couple of minutes, Rage Against the Machine. I'm sure that a lot of you who are listening to this podcast or watching are Rage Against the Machine fans. And I got to say, I have loved that band as far back as I can remember. In fact, the first time I ever saw Rage Against the Machine perform live was at Lollapalooza in the 90s in Dallas, Texas. And I was like an impressionable young teenage girl. And this is probably uh, one of the areas in my life where my, my activism came from. It definitely was influenced by those guys. And they were just so iconic and their mu- their music was great. Their their lyrics were great. Their philosophies were great. Their activism was great. And it's just amazing how this many years later, this many decades later, how impactful that still all is, how relevant that all is. And, um, you know, the band took a very long hiatus. And when they did, I started paying more attention to Tom Morello, specifically the guitar player of Rage Against the Machine. And he plays in a lot of different other projects as well. But he's just such a cool person. And, you know, he has a show on Sirius XM called One Man Revolution. And I discovered it by accident. And I started listening to him. And he's, he's got like, just like a really great personality. Plus, his, he's, he's very outspoken, which I appreciate. And I started following him on Twitter and Instagram and all that good stuff. And he's just such a cool guy. And I got to say, um, I really like seeing how he deals with things that are happening right now. And occasionally, people will give him a hard time on Twitter. I literally saw just a few weeks ago, somebody tweeted at Tom Morello and said something along the lines of like, yeah, why don't you like stop talking about politics and, and leave that to the actual like politicians. Just, you know, sit down, shut up and play your guitar is basically what they were saying. Like, so, like stop saying about politics. We don't want to hear about it. Just play your damn guitar. And everybody was like, what machine did you think they were raging against? <laughs> you cannot tell this band to stop, you know, talking about politics or whatever. Clearly this person had no idea about Rage Against a Machine that literally that is what the whole band is about is talking about politics, talking about social issues, talking about racism and all kinds of other topics that are still relevant today. And it was just hilarious to me. I'm like, you know, they're not raging for the machine. It's just, <laughs> what, what machine are they raging against? It just, it's, some people are just really clueless, I think is what it really boils down to. But, um, but it's really funny watching him like navigate all of this like craziness that's going on right now. I really respect him for it. And um, last week on the podcast, I was talking about feel-good stories. And I'm going to share another one with you guys having to do with Tom, something that he did I thought was so cool. It was one of those like tearjerker moments, but like in a good way. Uh, Earlier this year, there was a girl in the UK, I believe, and her name is uh, Nandi Bushel. And I probably am totally butchering that name, but N-A-N-D-I, Nandi Bushel, B-U-S-H-E-L-L. She is 10 years old and she plays guitar, she plays drums. This girl can rock out. And she has an Instagram page where specifically she was learning covers of Rage Against the Machine songs and she was playing the hell out of them. Like she would first play it on the drums and so there'd be like a whole a video of her playing, you know, a, a particular Rage song on the drums and she played on guitar. Then they would edit the videos together. So it was like, she was like playing all three instruments. And this girl was super, super talented, totally nailed these Rage Against the Machine um, songs. And it was impressive because she's only 10 years old. And of course, I'm always an advocate for young girls getting into music and playing instruments. So anyway, that video and that girl made its way to Tom Morello. He found out about her. And of course, he's like super impressed with her. So he gave her a guitar that was one of his guitars, but he coordinated with her parents so it would be a surprise. So the parents knew that this was coming. He like autographed it and everything. He made a little video for her saying like, hey, this is Tom from Rage Against Machine. I saw you playing the drums and and the guitars and you're awesome and you rock. And 
here, I am giving you this guitar. I mean, he said it way more eloquently than that. But he videoed himself doing that. He sent the family the video of him saying that to this little girl. The girl had no idea. And so then they filmed her watching this video for the first time. And then the parents brought in this package that she opened uh, She opened up and it was gu- the guitar that Tom Morello had given her. So it was just like, it was such an amazing moment. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing that Tom goes out of his way to do things like that for for people. And he just like, he really cares. And so um, if you get a chance to watch uh, One Man Revolution, check it out. He's very entertaining. And uh, I love people watching them trying to mess with him on Twitter and never ends well for them. <laughs> but yeah, he's a really good dude. And in fact, in Los Angeles, when I was living there, um, right before I met my husband, this was probably like 10 years ago or so, maybe nine years ago, I was at the Rainbow with some friends and we were sitting in a booth that was basically like a U-shaped booth. And there was another one right beside us. And so my back was basically to somebody else's back. And I was just hanging out with some friends and I just happened to like look over my shoulder. And as I was looking over my shoulder, I was looking at the person sitting directly behind him, behind me. And he too was also kind of looking my direction and our eyes met. And I was like, oh my God, Tom Morello. He was literally sitting behind me at the booth. And I was like, Tom, oh my God. And then as I'm like looking at him, like was like, oh my God, starstruck. You know, he's actually looking at me kind of the same expression. So I looked at him, I was like, I have all your albums. And he goes, I watched all your shows. And I was like, holy shit, Tom Morello watched Rock of Love. That's amazing. That's so, so cool. So anyway, I'm a big fan of his. And specifically with everything that's going on right now, I, I cannot believe that, you know, I mean, maybe it's because I, I have a sheltered, I've lived a sheltered upbringing. I, a lot of you can probably believe it. I can't believe it that yet another police shooting, this time in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake was shot by officers and is possibly paralyzed. He was shot in front of his kids. His back was turned when he was shot. Totally unnecessary. We definitely need some uh, police accountability. So if you guys, I always talk about empowering yourselves. When you vote, remember that you can vote in or out district attorneys. District attorneys are the ones that are gonna hold police accountable for these things. So definitely pay attention to who your district attorney is and what their policies are on this because police need to be held accountable. But I digress. Back to um, Tom Morello. He has a song in particular that's kind of an old song, but it's new to me. I just recently discovered it. And it's called Rabbit's Revenge. So it's got a really cool video. Go on YouTube, um, check it out. Rabbit's Revenge, Tom Morello. And it is um, featuring Killer Mark. Killer Mike and Big Boy, who you guys might know, did some work in Outcast. It's a really great song, and it was written years ago. The video was done years ago, but it is very much uh, relative today and talks about police brutality and people who were murdered by police. And it's just like, it's insane. You watch that song, and, and it's like, and you watch the video, you listen to the song. It totally is applicable to everything that's happening right now. So it's it's nuts, but it's really a great song. Well done, Tom's awesome. It's a great video, so definitely go check out Rabbit's Revenge. I think you guys will like it. I love the song. It's it's really awesome. It's it's a it's a dark subject, but it's a it's a rocking song. So anyway, with that said, um, I am excited for my next guest. Uh, we had Callie on from Real Chance of Love a few weeks ago, and now we have the winner of Real Chance of Love on Real Side. Corn Fed. Uh, her actual name is Abby, but you guys know her as Corn Fed. Hey, Abby, it's so nice to see you. You look fantastic. Wow, you look thank amazing. You. So do you. You look beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. I got to say, I, I'm really excited to have you. I just had Callie on a few weeks ago, and you were definitely one of my favorites from that show. I loved Callie, but I loved you as well. And I think everybody is excited for you to be coming on because you definitely were like, the, the sweet one and a, a little bit of like, you're your own person and you kind of stood out from the other girls in your like sweetness and your and how like innocent you were, you know? So um, I'm excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like I haven't really talked about this stuff in such a long time. So it's kind of cool to like reminisce and remember it because it was such an impactful time in my life. And I'm so grateful for the journey because it kind of molded me into the woman that I am today. And so this is awesome. Well, Thank that you. Makes me, you're so welcome. Well, that makes me really happy to hear because I will start out by saying that a lot of people who I have brought onto the podcast have told me that they they really didn't enjoy their time on the shows. Either they liked one show or they didn't like the other, or they had a hard time with both. Because, you know, I feel like a lot of people 
felt like they were exploited or taken advantage of or, or felt like they were duped in some way or, or made to look ridiculous or edited a certain way, you know, and then other people like had a great time with it and had a lot of fun with it. And we're like, yeah, maybe I looked bad like here or there, but that's just kind of part of it. I had fun either way. So I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was an awesome time for me. And I don't know if you know this, but I was also on I Love Money 4. Yes, I and do. <laughs> so Real Chance of Love was an awesome time for me. I mean, there was a lot of things that went on that like I wasn't used to. I'm from a really small town of 8,000 people. And so, you know, how vocal and just in your face the women were. I wasn't used to that kind of lifestyle. Like I, right. I grew up in small town. We're pretty conservative, northern Minnesota. And so it's more like, people that talk behind each other's back instead of saying it to your face, <laughs> which I'm so grateful because like it literally gave me a backbone for who I am today. But I Love Money 4 was such a different experience in Real Chance of Love. Like Real Chance of Love, I was kind of more innocent and um, I'm a relationships person and I'm a girl's girl. And so like, even though some of the women were kind of like crazy and in your face, I had a way of still forming awesome relationships. But I love money for like, when it comes to money, people get crazy. Yes. You know, it's like a yes. whole different ball game. And I'm, I'd like to think I'm not super competitive and I'm definitely not athletic. <laughs> and so it was just the wrong show for me altogether. But I loved um, Real Chance of Love. Oh, well, good. Well, I'm really happy to hear that. Well, let's, Let's start back from the beginning. So um, I knew that you were from a small town. And and so I, what I wonder is, how did you end up from this small town to ending up on this show? Like, take us through the journey of how that happened. Well, I love all of the Of Love shows. I loved Flavor of Love. I loved Rock of Love. I, I loved every, I loved New York, loved it all. And so... Um, I was just like a reality show junkie. I would watch it. And I had a crush on Real and Chance when oh. I would watch the show. <laughs> and so I don't even know how I came upon the website to be able to apply. And I was, I just kind of left this little blurb of like, I'm this feisty Lebanese woman from Northern Minnesota, or I actually lived in Fargo, North Dakota at the time. So I said from Fargo, North Dakota. And that's probably the reason that they interviewed me because they were like, what in the heck is a girl from Fargo, <laughs> North Dakota doing wanting to be on one of these shows? And so immediately they emailed me back and said that they wanted an on-camera interview with me. And so wow. that's where it kind of all started. I loved all of these shows and I never in a million years thought that I would get an opportunity to be on one of these shows. Um, but I did and wow. it was awesome. I did the interview process and they loved me, I guess. Did you have to do the interview? <laughs> did you do the interview uh, in person? Like, did you fly out or did you just do it? Like, how'd you do the interview? I flew to, oh, where did I go? I want to say Detroit, Michigan. Okay. They flew, I flew out there and did the interview process. And then they called me back and I flew out to LA. And oh, wow. I had made the show. That's incredible. That's really interesting because a lot of the other people that I have talked to have said that, that either they were like sought out or they were somewhere where they were approached. And someone said like, hey, do you want to come onto this show? And a lot of the girls didn't even know that it was going to be like on Rock of Love. They didn't know it was going to be Brett or they didn't know it was going to be Flavor Flavor. They didn't know on Charm School it was going to be Sharon or Monique or whoever. So it's interesting. And I think that puts you at an advantage that you knew who it was going to be. And um, I got to say, that's really cool because I would imagine so many people applied and auditioned. And the fact that you got it that way is pretty impressive. And um, yeah. so was that your first? Was what, oh, sorry, sorry. what's that? Oh, it was cool. Like they didn't tell me right away that it was going to be real and chance, but I kind of had a feeling they, they asked us who we would like it to be. Um, and I went into it hoping that it was real and chance. Yeah. Like I really wanted it to be them. And, and really I looked at it and I'm like, okay, if you look at the guys that could potentially have their own show, they were really the only ones that were entertaining enough. Right. Yes. <laughs> they were amazing. Super entertaining. <sighs> yeah. So, so was your family like freaking out and like your friends and stuff when you're like, so I'm going to LA to be on a TV show where they're like, what? How did that happen? Like, did you want well, to be I on TV? I couldn't really talk about it a lot. Um, but I, of course I told my parents and they were freaking out. My dad is like uber supportive. You know, I was always um, into musicals and theater and oh. 
I was a pageant girl. And so I was always like bopping around trying new things. And so he was super supportive of it. My mom is like a homebody and super emotional. And so <laughs> she had a she had a really hard time letting me go do this. Um, and like I said, we're from a small town. Nobody in our town had ever done anything like this before. And so it was a pretty big deal. And I couldn't talk about it. But when I had gotten back and the show aired, I mean, I was like famous. I bet. Know? Yeah, especially in a small town. Wow. That is so cool. So had that been your first time to LA? Yes. Oh, wow. It was. And then I ended up moving there after the show. And that's like a whole new thing. <laughs> I, ta- I did talk to Callie a little bit about all that too. I guess like a lot of girls were all living sort of in the same area after the shows. But um, that's really wild. So was that kind of like a bit of a culture shock for you going from this small town to Los Angeles, which is like a totally insane. I lived there for 14 years. I had to move away because it was got too insane for me. I'm like, I'm too old for this shit. (laughs) But um, (laughs) was that just like total culture shock for you? Absolutely. I mean, just even getting to LA, I had never, I'd never been there. And I had never really witnessed a big city like that. The biggest city that I can even remember, Minneapolis, I guess, because (laughs) I live about three and a half hours from there. I'd been to Florida, but like never a big city like that. You know, I I guess I'd been to New York, but I mean, it was just so it's just different, you know, and the people were different and the culture is different. You know, They, they call us Minnesota nice you know? (laughs) And so it was completely different. I mean, people don't even, I'm not trying to be rude, but people don't even really look you in the eye. I grew up in Texas and I feel like the people in the South and people in the Midwest have this like very like sincere friendliness, warmth, and um, people in California are definitely like their own breed. And so you got to be sort of thick skinned to to survive out there. And I'm in Las Vegas now, so life's a little easier here than California. But um, but yeah, the culture shock. And you're right. And being from Minnesota, I have friends out in Minnesota, actually, and everybody there is like so nice and super cool and laid back. So yeah, you're totally right about that. So um, when, you, when you first arrived at the show, what was that like? Because I would imagine it was very overwhelming to you because as you said, like the girls were like really intense on your season and having the guys come out, like what was the overall emotion for you? Were you like feeling confident? Were you feeling good about it? Or were you like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? So when I, after our like second interview process, when they were kind of like gearing us up to go to the mansion, I felt really confident. They were telling me how much they loved me. They were like, you're a shoe in da da da. And then we get to the lobby and none of the girls can talk to each other. You're supposed to remain quiet, you know, before we go to the mansion and I'm like sizing all these girls up and I'm super intimidated. First of all, I have like a polka dotted black and pink dress on (laughs) and I look like Susie Homemaker and they're all in like slutty, like (laughs) bras and like short skirts. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm so getting eliminated the first (laughs) night. Like I, I had no idea. Like I thought I looked sexy and I look like, uh, like 1950s housewife. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was I definitely mean, intimidated. Sexiness is in the eyes of the beholder. So um, I, I definitely, everybody was in their own unique way. But yeah, you like you were such a, a trip because you definitely very much stood out. And it's amazing that not only did you make it all the way through that show, but like you ended up winning the whole thing, which is incredible. I mean, did you, did you, I mean, you just said you thought that you're going to be eliminated. But as soon as you started talking to, real did you go like okay I kind of feel connection here I actually might I might make it like did you have any idea that you could actually win this whole thing I didn't just because it was it was hard like I didn't know what he was really thinking I mean I only knew what he would tell me you know um but I did feel like we had a really great connection he was really easy to talk to we definitely agreed on a lot of things we're both Christians he's a really like awesome, God-fearing man. And we connected on a lot of like the same morals and the same values. And I, I really appreciated that about him because, you know, you've got a lot of women there that are like trying to kind of be in the spotlight and put on. And, um, I was so not used to that. (laughs) I was, I just, I, I didn't know how to be anything other than myself. And I had never been on camera before. I had never done anything like this before. So it was so out of my element. Oh, wow. And that part of it, you know, I didn't want 
my parents or my family or, or anybody, my friends, anybody watching this back and being like, holy Abby, like that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> You're right. being crazy. We're disowning you. <laughs> you right. know, I didn't want any of that, you know? So I was very careful about how I portrayed myself. I was definitely myself and I, I'm a people person. I'm a people pleaser. I'm a girl's girl. Like I just, I love making people happy. Like that's my whole purpose in life is just to like bring people joy. Aww. And so I was trying to make friends. I was being myself and it was like, I don't know. It, it was such a shit show. Honestly. Yeah. It's super, super cutthroat as well. And one thing I was going to ask you too is, so I had sort of figured out when I was doing Rock of Love, I had kind of figured out that Brett probably wasn't really there like for love, you know? And the reason I figured that, that out is because it was the, literally the exact same format as Flavor of Love. And, you know, Flavor of Flav is like, I'm here to find love. Like, oh, I found love. Oh, it didn't work out. Okay, now here's Flavor of Love 2. I'm here to find love. Oh, I found love. Oh, it didn't work out. Here's Flavor of Love 3. You know, and so like watching that, I'm like you. I was obsessed with all those shows. I loved Flavor of Love. I love I love New York and, and Surreal Life and all of them. And so by the time I was on Rock of Love, I sort of figured it out. And I ended up asking Brett directly himself. Uh, if he was really here for love and like, did he have a, did he really not have a girlfriend? And he was honest with me, thankfully. But um, so by the time it got to your show, there had been so many of these things. And typically it doesn't work out in like finding love. And typically they end up doing like a second season and a third season, that sort of thing. So did you have that in the back of your mind or did you go like, oh, well, I have this connection with him and maybe that overrides any of the other ways that shows have been done? You know, call me an irrational dreamer, but I thought that it was going to be different. I, I guess I'm like a fairy tale person. I like, I believe in love and I, I don't know, maybe I was naive, but I thought we were going to work out. It's, it's kind of crazy that I think that because looking back, like I did listen to Callie's interview and I knew, I didn't know at the time that MILF was like staying in his room every single night and they were probably hooking up, you know, <laughs> I wasn't staying in his room every night and he picked me. I'm like, how in the world was I so stupid? But at the time, like I was so in it and I was feeling all these things and I'm, I can't fake anything. Like I'm not that good of an actress. So like I was really in it. I cared about him and I thought this was going to be different. And we did date outside of the show for a little bit, but when I did go to visit him, he had mentioned something about a potential season two. And I like my stomach just dropped. Ah, uh, that's heartbreaking. And this is what was so funny. Like, this is how naive I am. So I'm like, so what does that mean? Like, am I going to be there with you? And like, chance is going to find love or like, what is this going to look like? And he wouldn't say anything. And that's when I kind of like my stomach kind of dropped. And I knew, I knew like, I, I loved him. Like I, I did. I mean, it's not anything compared to what real love is. I'm, I'm married. I have three kids. I know what like your love of your life is. But at the time, what I knew of love, that was love. That makes so. sense. That That's really heartbreaking. And it's amazing to me how many people go through this experience. And you know what? I, I get it. Like, it, you know, I can sit here and go like, well, you know, how could people not know that these people were not really there for love? But if you're in the moment, you're in your own shoes, you're in your own perspective, and you genuinely are feeling that spark and that connection with him, then of course you could go, well, maybe this is going to be one of the first times where where it's different, where it works out differently. So I, I totally get that. And um, I know I know Callie was pretty crushed with how everything went down with her and Chance. Um, so I would imagine that you were you were pretty heartbroken, huh? I was, and it was difficult when the show was airing because I would get really emotional watching it back because we had broken up while the show was airing. Oh, wow. And and then the hopeless romantic that I was was thinking, okay, reunion show, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to win it back. And that didn't happen. And so it was just weird. I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I hadn't lived in that kind of world at all. And like I said, I'm an irrational dreamer and I'm a hopeless romantic. And I thought for sure, like I could go back over the reunion show is moving out to LA. Like we could totally make this work. And when I got there for the reunion, just like having that backstage interview as they were like gearing me up to go out there, the questions that they were asking me, I knew for sure they were up to something yeah. and I wouldn't really play into some into what they were, you know, trying to have me talk about. Okay. And then 
I think that they wanted it to make or they wanted to make it look different than it actually was. Like this whole breakup was my fault. Like I got psycho or something. Are you serious? So what kind of questions were they asking you? Well, okay, first of all, how long, when you say you dated after the show, what does that, what does that mean exactly? So we were together probably at least, gosh, I mean, it, it was like 10 years ago now. Um, I you would, would say probably other, right? a month or two okay. after the show. Okay. And so it was, you would go and it would just be like you and him and you would really feel, continue to feel this spark and this magic between the two of you. I went, I flew out there and stayed at his house and oh, wow. I don't think we were supposed to be doing that, <laughs> but I did. And then Callie lived there. So I would see Callie and then we would talk about me moving out there. It was real life for me. I mean, we, no cameras, you know, stayed there dated well we hid you know because you're not supposed to be seen um but yeah it was real life for me wow that's that is intense and so did you ever have like a real conversation aside from him telling you that there was going to be a second real chance of love did you did he ever say like hey just so you know this isn't going to work out or whatever or did just sort of like just stop you guys just stop talking we basically just stopped. He just stopped responding to me. Oh, that's basically. sad. I'm yeah, sorry. It, that's heartbreaking. Sad. Wow. Yeah. Well, I would imagine it's yeah. difficult for them as well because I mean, I, I, I'm totally just guessing right now. I have, I'm not basing this on anything, but I would imagine that he probably did feel something for you, but then the motivate, and maybe he wasn't expecting for this to happen, but the motivation behind doing these shows obviously was a career driven choice and not just for real and chance, but for everybody who did these shows. So, um, and I think that's why a lot of people ended up getting their heart, their hearts broken who came on as like the, the, um, the competition or the cast or whatever you want to call it. So now when you were at the reunion show, you were saying the producers were sitting down with you. So I will say that a lot of the things that we talk about on this podcast, we talk a lot about the producers because I really like for everybody who is watching to kind of get an idea of how everything went down. Because the number one thing that I got asked after Rock of Love was like how much of it was real and how much of it was scripted. And I would say that like the majority of it was was real in the context of like, we weren't being told to say certain lines. But of course the environment is, you can't get any more artificial than that. Like that's not a real life scenario of how you would like try to date or find love, you know? So, but given that, artificial environment. It, it was all the events that happened, at least on Rock of Love, were real for the most part. But the producers were definitely manipulating the situation a lot of times. Like if they if they wanted to steer things a certain way, that's when they would sort of get involved and pull people aside and like whisper in their ear and, and that sort of thing. So um, I love talking about that kind of stuff just because it's, it's fascinating. And so what would you say was their influence? Obviously, they were trying to get in your ear at the reunion show. Well, I, I loved the producers, first of all, because they loved me and they obviously were rooting for me because I think they put me in situations that made me look really good. <laughs> you know, like they weren't trying to make me look bad. At, I think that they knew that I was going to be the one. Mm-hmm. And I think they saw our connection and it made the most sense. Like if you really look at the man that real was and you look at who I was, we made the most sense, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I loved everything about it. And then we got to reunion and because it didn't work out, there had to be a storyline, right? Like Ah, there has to be a reason, you know? That's true. And he is the one that came up with the reason. Whether or not it was what he was experiencing, I think he fabricated a lot of it because I know I'm not crazy. And they made it seem like when I went out to visit him and they didn't air any of this. So I just want to like make that clear because at the reunion show, it went down way different because I wouldn't let it go down the way that they wanted it to look. Okay. So they were asking me questions that kind of made it seem like I went crazy and I got like all stalkerish and oh like God. flipped out. And wow. I was like, okay, this doesn't even fit who I am as a person. Right. Um, Nobody would have believed that too. That wouldn't have made any sense because yeah. you were like the, the sane one of the show. Yeah. And I don't know that it was necessarily... I'm, you know, obviously producers are good at their job. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it was 100% producers. I know that real probably had something to do with it too, but they wanted a season two. They did. Right, so it right. had to be something big because everybody loved me. I was America's sweetheart. So they had to make it look like I messed up somehow. Right. For in order to get, that's what I think personally. Yeah. Um, so when they were asking me these questions, it was like, so how did you feel when hoops 
text messaging him. And I'm like, how did you even know that? Wow. She (laughs) texted him when I was visiting him. Yeah. So, and I was like, whatever, you know, like I didn't, we're not even together anymore. So whatever. Right. You know, so it was like hard for me to play into any of it. And I kept saying like, it, well, it was like months ago. I don't know. Yeah. So I wouldn't really play into it. So my whole thing is when I went out there on stage, I basically wanted to try and make it work. And so I, I knew that if I was there to try and make it work and I was very sweet and I stayed true to who I was, they couldn't flip it on me and make me look crazy. Smart. That was smart of you. That was really <laughs> smart. You. Yeah, you took control. And like, you know, I got to say, I really love the producers too. And I had such a great time with all of them. They're all super sweet and fun and good energy. <clears throat> and, um, but yeah, certain times you can see that they're trying to do something specific and you're like, I know what you're doing. (laughs) And you kind of have to take control of the situation, but you also have to have like an awareness of what's going on in order to uh, take control of the situation. Because there's other times where, you know, the producers take control and you're not seeing it. And then you end up being led down this path and you're like, wait a minute, how did I get here? This was not what I was intending at all, you know? And then other times, if you can see it, then you can go like, ah, that's what I see what you're doing. And (laughs) I'm not going down that road. So um, yeah. that was smart that you were able to do that. So when you finally were on stage and um, and you and your agenda was to like, maybe we can make this work and, and that sort of thing. What what ultimately was the reason, um, you're gonna have to refresh my memory because I, I, I'm having a foggy memory about the reunion show specifically. Mm-hmm. What was the reason that you guys decided that was gonna be given to the audience? So we left the reunion telling the audience that we were gonna try and make it work because I was moving there. And so then after that, it just didn't, he just didn't reach out to me. Like I even messaged him that night. We all went out for like to party afterwards. And from what I remember, Chance was messaging his girls and real wouldn't talk to me. So I just think he was done with it. He had no interest in making it work and that's fine. You know, it was just, I wish that there would have just been some truth, I guess, you know, like not just putting on, like, I I felt like I deserved more than what I was given. And I mean, at the end of the day, I know that he didn't try and hurt my feelings, but yeah, I I totally get it. And I, I, yeah, that's right. I remember now why I don't remember because you guys didn't actually give a reason. And yeah, that's right. You guys were like, we're going to try to make it work out. I do remember Mm -hmm. that now. And um, yeah, my, my heart breaks for you. And you know, unfortunately, I just think it's a really difficult situation for everybody involved because the nature of these shows is that it's supposed to come to a conclusion and then not, you know, and then start over again. And so, you know, um, I, I would love to be inside of the head of like, of these people who do the shows. Um, hopefully one day I'll be able to bring Brett Michaels on and stuff like that. But I mean, even with that, it, it makes me wonder, like, do they have any any guilt? Do they... Like, how do they feel going into it? Because I think that a lot of these people don't anticipate people actually falling in love with them. Like, I would imagine, like, from Brett Michaels' perspective or Flavor Flavor or Real and Chance, I would imagine you go on going, like, this is going to be a really fun TV show. There's going to be all these fun people. It's going to be really fun. And you're not thinking, like, oh, people are going to fall in love with me and then get their hearts broken, you know? And so probably when it gets to that point of, like, okay, well, I'm trying to continue out with my career. This person is trying to have a connection with me. That does put everybody in a really awkward, weird situation. and. I, and you just mentioned, like, I just wish there could have been some kind of truth. I mean, like, God, don't we all? <laughs> you know, I think I think truth is a thing that doesn't, interestingly enough, does not really exist in, in reality television. You don't really know what is happening or why things are happening. Or is, is it like, is it Brett Michaels that thinks this? Is it is it real? Is it chance? Is it, you know, any of these people? Or is it the producers? Like, you know, it's it's a it's a weird, weird, weird situation that we are all put in. And um, I'm always sorry for the people who put their hearts into it because on Rock of Love, I didn't put my heart into it because I'm like, I don't trust that this is a safe situation to do that. And um, and I'm really, really grateful that I that I didn't. But so many people share your same story where they just got crushed, you know? And yeah. I think it's great you were able to continue and, and keep doing shows and not let it like really get the better of you. Yeah. And I I'm so grateful for the journey. I'm so grateful for you know, God has a plan. And so it's like, it's in his hands, not mine. And so his bigger plan was for me to do what I'm doing now. And so if I wouldn't have went through that experience and walked that journey, I wouldn't be where I am today. And all the learning lessons and all the growing. And I'm so grateful. I always say that I'm so grateful 
for the journey. Um, at the time, you know, heartbreak sucks. It's never easy, but you learn so much from heartbreak that I wouldn't be here and in love and happy and (laughs) successful (laughs) if I wouldn't have walked through that, you know, and I do know that God put me in that situation to strengthen me, to better me, you know? So I'm grateful for that. Well, I think that's a really great positive perspective. I I really like that. Um, So let's go back. Okay, the beginning of um, of being on the show. Uh, And I do want to get into I Love Money with you as well, but I just want to um, ask you a few more things about being on this show because I'm still fascinated by the chance that you were like really the, the odd woman out and then you made it work. So on like right out the gate and the beginning of, of all of this, uh, some of the girls kind of gave you a hard time. But I, I think Kiki was one of the ones that really kind of laid into you in the beginning. Yeah. Well, I mean, clearly she wasn't there to make friends. <laughs> and I was, evidently. I mean, I wasn't like sitting or I didn't want it to make it you know, I wasn't going around from person to person being like, do you want to be my friend? Like, I'm not desperate, but I was literally there for the experience. And so, you know, I was just being myself and, and experiencing it as it came. And I'm, I'm brought, I was brought up differently. I lived in a small town and these women were like, had walls up and they're used to like, probably having to defend themselves. And I wasn't used to that, you know? And so I'm probably, she probably thought I was crazy, like coming up and trying to be a nice person. She's like, what's your agenda? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so, no, I mean, I do think that a lot of the women were probably used to a different type of lifestyle than me. Like, like I said, I'm Minnesota nice. I may, I have a lot of friends. I'm used to nice women. I'm used to all of that. And I wasn't there to fight with anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't going to fight with anybody. And so I don't know if some of that was like she had her guard up or, you know, from where she's from or what that was. But to her, you know, we're complete opposite. I yeah. love Kiki now. Like we follow each other on social media. We oh, comment nice. on each other's stuff. It's great. Oh, nice. Um, I love that. But at the time, you know, we're just two different people. Right. That totally makes sense. And then also um, one of the other girls that kind of gave everybody a run for their money was MILF. Um, How was that dealing with her? Was that difficult for you? Or were you, it seemed like you were just able to make it work with everybody and you kind of were like water off a duck's back for the most part. But did you you have challenges with people like MILF? And also um, on the flip side of that, who who did you really feel safe with there of the women? Like who did you feel you bonded with the most? MILF was probably the most challenging because we were going for the same guy and I could tell that we were the two that he liked the most. Mm -hmm. And she was definitely somebody that, well, she was quite a bit older, I think, than like 10 years older than all of us. And she had a lot of life experiences. I mean, I think she was like in Playboy and like done some soft porn Mm -hmm. or something. Like, I'm not here to air her dirty laundry. Right. But- But Totally like different. She had some life experiences and right. I don't judge anyone. Like that's what she did to make her money and do her thing. And that was her life. And, but she had experiences in life and she was a lot more sexual and a lot more seductive. And, um, she had a way with him and I didn't get it because I'm like, she's 10 years older than you. Like <laughs> what is happening? You know, like I did not understand what the attraction was. I'm like, come on, I'm young and vibrant and cute. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. I didn't get it. And I did not think in a million years that she would be my competition. Yeah. You, know? you guys are totally different from each other. And it is kind of <laughs> interesting. I mean, you would think that, that everybody would have like a type you know, and that if you, you know, the the girls that he picked all would be similar to each other in some regard. But yeah, that would totally throw me for a loop as well. But like, how how is this, you know, how are we all, how are we all in the same I'm boat like here? I'm super buttoned up and she's like hanging out. I'm like, <laughs> how does this happen? We're like 10 years apart and we're polar opposites now. But yeah, yeah, he liked her, man. He liked her. What was, <laughs> what was one of your favorite moments of the whole season? Like the standout moment that was like, the most fun or like what really made it worth it for you? Oh my gosh. I mean, the whole experience was awesome. I traveled to places that I had never been. We were treated like royalty. We were spoiled. I mean, they did my makeup. They put me in nice dresses. Like 
it was just so much fun. I'm so grateful for the experience. I mean, I still have bonds today with some of the women like Callie and, um, gosh, I don't know if I can pinpoint anything specific, but I think probably that last trip to Puerto Rico, because we were winding down and I kind of knew that if it, I knew it was me. I knew he didn't have the same connection with Bay Bay Bay. I mean, there's that little piece in your mind that's like, well, what if? But right. it, if it wasn't me, it wasn't going to be anybody, anybody because I knew that they were just more of like a friendship and I knew what we had. And so I kind of started to feel like that's when it shifted to like, I, I'm kind of falling in love, yeah. you know? Wow. And so that's, that, that trip was awesome. The experience, like we got to spend a lot more one-on-one time together. We got to like do overnights and all of that. And so we got to talk off camera. So that was a nice experience. And I don't know. I I think that was probably my favorite, to be honest. That's awesome. I I love that. Yeah. And it was so beautiful where you guys were too, just to have this like beautiful setting and everything. And so one thing that was um, really stood out to me about your season as well, I remember when I was watching it back and I was thinking, um, I was thinking to myself how how much more intense it was, not only the girls, but like your challenges. Um, I was talking to Callie about this as well, the challenge where the guys had a, like a fake fight basically with each other and there was like police and talk of like going to trial and stuff like that. Like, oh my God, I just can't believe you guys dealt with that. Did you, were you like the same as Callie? Were you seriously thinking, oh my God, what's happening? Like, did you believe it was real or was there any part of you that thought that that maybe this is, you know, a made up thing for to trick you guys? Uh, well, a little bit of me was like, no way. Like he, there's no way that real would crack a bottle over somebody's head. He's way too nice. Yeah. <laughs> but then and they really made us believe this was happening. And then I was questioned by the police and that was all foreign to me. I, I mean, I live in Northern Minnesota. Like you, there's nothing like that ever happens. They're not bar fights that break out like that. And I was one of the ones that was bawling my eyes out And they like kept trying, they liked it. I swear they enjoyed making me cry harder and harder. They were like, this is really good. (laughs) We're really getting some good content here. Right. Because I was crying. It was horrible. Praying, crying. Oh my gosh, the whole works. Oh my God. That is like insane to me that, that, I mean, that was just like a whole psychological mind fuck as far as I could tell, you know? (laughs) So and oh, by the way, I loved you on the wrestling too. I thought the wrestling challenge was really fun. And oh. I, I, that was so cute. <laughs> that was a good I actually one too. watched WWE growing up. I loved wrestling. Oh, really? And so when we got to do that challenge, it was super cool for me. Yeah. Oh my God, that was great. And the other thing too that I liked, um, it's I am so grateful that we were not given nicknames on Rock of Love. And I remember the first episode where you guys were being given your nicknames. And when he said corn fed, you just started laughing. And you were just like, okay, <laughs> that is the most ridiculous nickname I think of. I mean, actually there are some probably more ridiculous. MILF is pretty ridiculous too, but corn fed, <laughs> where you like, thanks. Or you just like, whatever. There's nothing cute about that. Like nothing <laughs> cute about corn fed. And even Michelle Brando is like, I never, it never meant to be bad. And I'm like, what is good about it? Like, tell it's, me, corn fed? I mean, it couldn't have been like Fargo or something I know. cute. There are so many other ones. I mean, when I think of corn fed, I think of livestock. <laughs> you know, and you are definitely the furthest thing from livestock. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you are not a representation of livestock or four legged animals or anything that eats corn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was really, really funny and and silly, but I love it. You just kind of like took, took it with a grain of salt. You just kind of laughed it off and you're like, whatever. But yeah, that was, yeah. that was pretty funny. So, so, okay. Um, so now let's get into, um, I love money. So how soon after you completed doing Real Chance of Love were you asked to do I love money? It was about a year later. So oh, okay. it was kind of crazy because the, the I Love Money series was so popular that they did one and two. And then you remember they did three and four back to back. So when you guys were like flying out, we were flying in because it was uh. so popular. They wanted to keep it going. And so that was I mean, I was shocked that they called me to do it, to be honest, because I don't know that they really ever had. Oh, I guess they had hoops on it, but I was just surprised that they had any winners on it because it's. They always say it's like the re- <laughs> the rejects, like the people that didn't win get another chance to win, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. Um, 
I guess that's true. Yeah, I'm thinking about who all they brought on to like charm school as well. Um, you Were you ever asked to do charm school? No, just I no, don't No, I wasn't. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, the whole I love money thing was so insane because yeah, as you just said, I was on season three. And so um, that's right. So I guess right when we were back, we had just finished taping. And so you guys were probably already there. Did you know, did anybody tell you while you guys were filming what had happened with our season, with season three? Yeah, so when I got picked off, I went to the hotel and there was like no TV, no phone, no anything. And it was, I wanted to call my mom and they wouldn't let me right away. And until one of the producers came in and had a conversation with me about what oh, had happened. They didn't want you to hear it through somebody else before they got to talk to you about it first. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, how far did you make? You made it like halfway through I Love Money, right? How far like did you nine make Nine episodes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember you made it pretty far. So, okay. So what did the, how did the producer break it to you? He just came in and kind of had told me what happened. And I was in total shock. I was probably bawling my eyes out because I'm a crier <sighs> and just sick to my stomach. Like, how could anybody ever do that? You know, I mean, it was just, it was devastating. It was really devastating. And so, I don't know. I, I think everything just kind of disappeared at that point because I was just so heartbroken for the situation that happened. Yeah, it was really wild. It, it, was, it was crazy for me as well because like I lived with the guy on set for a month, you know? And um, I wasn't a fan of his. I, I had an alliance with him, but I didn't like him personally. But still, mm -hmm. like, you don't expect that. It, it was just like, the worst I thought of him was I thought he was arrogant, you know? I, you never would guess that somebody could do something like that. And I remember when it was all going down and they were still doing I Love Money Forward, still going forward with it. I, I had mixed feelings about that. But I mean, for you guys' sake, I'm, I'm glad that it happened. And um, did you feel like, I had heard rumors that it was pretty heavily edited though. Like they tried to focus more on challenges and less on the, the fights and the conflict and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Would you say, when you watched it back, would you say that that's accurate? Yeah, I would say that's probably pretty accurate. And I know that, I don't know if your season drank a lot, but they were like, we're taking your guys' alcohol because really? <laughs> you guys drank way more than this previous season. Oh, no, and like, I mean, so no, we drank. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think everybody okay. drank on, on all of the shows for the most part. Right? And so, so maybe the reason that is that they didn't want to tell us because they didn't want to tell us what happened going into it because it would have probably put us in a different emotion. So maybe the reason that they didn't allow us to drink as much is because they didn't want anything crazy to go. Yeah. I'm sure they were like walking on eggshells at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say so. So what were the some of the things that happened that we as the viewers of I Love Money 4 didn't get to see? Was there any like crazy things, like crazy events that like just didn't make it to the, to the uh, editing room? Oh, well, one thing that you guys didn't see is that me and Chi Chi kind of had a thing going on. Yeah. <laughs> Chi Chi is um, awesome. He was just here last week and um, I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago and he's amazing. He's super cute. I, I totally get it. I'm, I'm sure like all the people watching right now are going to be super jealous of you right now because everybody loves Chi Chi. <laughs> so I didn't I know that. So you guys kind of had a, had a thing. We, he's so sweet. And I think it started off just like, He's so sweet and we had kind of similar personalities. So we just like always talked and, and, and just kind of comforted each other. And then we just kind of would cuddle and had like a little thing and it wasn't shown, but he also like had a thing for like all the girls. Cause he's just so charming and cute and like had a crush on everybody. And, and so I don't know, like they didn't really show it and we didn't really make it a thing, but yeah, oh, we kept in touch though. Yeah. And we still follow each other on social media. There's this big country music festival that happens every year in my town. And he worked for Big and Rich. And Big and Rich is like here every other year. So I would see him. Oh. And so I've been on stage with him. We still kept in contact, it, the whole thing. And so he's he's still such a sweet guy. Oh, I love that. That makes me really happy. He is a great, he's a great, great guy. And I love Sinister as well. So that is so cool. Yeah, when he was here, we were talking a little bit about Britannia. And he was telling me that he kind of had like a thing going on with for Tanya, but then there was like a love triangle. And so I actually heard a, a rumor about you and, and Heat. Is that accurate? Or is that just a rumor? 
That we had a thing? That you had a thing, yeah. <laughs> we kind of had a thing. You kind of had a thing? We did. We kind of had a thing. Um, yeah. Um, it's like so crazy. But we we talked and then I went out to visit Callie and we like hung out a little bit and dated a little bit. We talked on the phone a lot, but um, it didn't really work out. But yeah. yeah it was <laughs> That's Look so at cute. me. I'm like, I kind of had a thing with him and a thing with him and a thing with him. <laughs> Girl, I am like, all about it. I Listen, I am, there is no shame here. I am very, very open. I'm very happily married now. I've been married, I've been with my husband for eight years. But before that, I was like a big old hussy. Like I slept with everyone. Like pretty much, I'm sure I slept with half the people watching the podcast. So no <laughs> hate here. I'm all for it. I think it's really cute. I just, um, I, I like seeing who, who connects. And you know, one thing that's so, cool about getting to do these like co-ed shows is it, it allows room for that kind of stuff. And it, it just makes it more fun, you know? And it, um, I mean, yeah, of course, like these shows are so stressful anyway. And there's just always so much drama going on and, and like fights and then alcohol and crying and like, you know, and then these challenges and like, you don't want to be sent home. So like, of course, if you can get like a little comfort on the side here and there, then like, yeah, of course. And, and we had some of that as well on, um, on, <laughs> on, on my season of I Love Money 3. What was really funny is though so Sinister is like, you know, I don't even know how tall he is, but I would guess he's probably like five foot five or so. And, and, he, and at the time he was like super goth and had like the goth hair. And then um, Chelsea, her, she, was on, um, she was on my show as well on I Love Money 3, but she was on uh, for the love of Ray J. And what was her name on For the Love of Ray J? I think it was Lil Hood. That's what it was. She was Lil Hood on For the Love of Ray J. And so she is like also very small. It's funny because she probably weighs like 80 pounds and, and like half of her weight is in her boobs. Like, but she's super cute, like big blonde hair, very tiny, tiny little frame. She's all she's probably like five foot four, five foot five also. But she's like Barbie doll and then Sinister was like super goth. And they like were, they were like the same exact size as each other. They were both like these little tiny like pixie people. But then they would like, you know, they were like having a little cuddle fest thing going on. Like I like I wouldn't necessarily call it like a it's kind of a semi-romance, I guess. And it was it was cute though. It was really cute because it was like Barbie and like Marilyn Manson, you know, it was like such a funny little yes. thing. But um, but yeah, so that kind of stuff, like it definitely happened, you know, people had fun on these shows and it really makes it like a lot more bearable. But, um, you know, I just, I just love seeing it because I think it's really cute, you know, and seeing who like pairs up, you know, was there yeah. any kind of like well, jealousies on your, like were people pairing up and like, was there like, know, not so much. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Is this a welcome to Skype? <laughs> <laughs> but Britannia and Punisher were together every single night. And I do remember Chi Chi being like brokenhearted about it because off the show, they did have a little thing is what he had said. And, or no, oh my gosh, that's right. Okay, what, 20 pack? So Britannia was with 20 pack because he came on our season. He was on season two and then also came on our season. So she was with him and then he got kicked off like the first episode. And then she was hooking up with Punisher. Okay. That makes sense. So, that makes way more sense. I, I'm trying to like visually imagine Chi Chi and Britannia. I'm like, she would kill him. Like, like not even on purpose. It would just like happen somehow. Like what, what happened to Chi Chi? I accidentally killed him. You know, <laughs> like my breast <laughs> fell on top of him and smashed him to death. Like rest in peace, Chi Chi. You know, death by breast. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> I thought it was really funny imagining those two together. But um but yeah, but I, I love that with you and Chi Chi. Like he's he's such a like a sweet guy and you're such a sweet girl. Cause I could absolutely see that being a thing. So um what did, so if you had planned on winning the show, what did you have plans for that money? What was it, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, quarter of a million dollars? Honestly, I I was there for the experience with that one too, because I am not athletic and I'm not super competitive. Like I was more competitive on Real Chance of Love than I was on I Love Money. The, you know, the men were super manipulative and women are more emotional. And so as much as we wanted to stick together with all the women and have like this whole flower power alliance, the men would always manipulate everything and they would kind of plot and turn us against one another. And so then we would end up doing things that we didn't want to do, but had to do because the men were kind of winning the competitions because it's very athletic. And I am not, unless you train for that as a woman, those challenges are so difficult. 
They so were difficult. really difficult. And there was, um, there was a couple on my season that were actually like scary as well. Like we had a height one where we were like way up high and, and like, yeah, I remember that was scary. But I've, I've told this uh, story a couple of times before on the podcast, but I'll just tell you quickly. Um, I was able to get through my season. I'm not, I'm like kind of athletic, not particularly though, but um, I ended up forming an alliance with the opposite team. And I agreed to throw all of my team's challenges if the other team wouldn't send me home. So that's how I skated oh, through I love my it. entire season. <laughs> I love it. See, I, our team lost everything because I sucked at everything. So basically, <laughs> it was always my fault that we lost because I was horrible. But what people didn't know is that I sprained my ankle jumping off the boat before it even started. Oh, and no. they didn't show me going to like the hospital, getting an x-ray, none of that. Oh and my so- God. I was still able to go on and perform in a lot of them, but I really sucked at everything. And what I hated so badly is that I looked back at the, you know, when I watched it, they made me look so clumsy, so (laughs) terrible. They, Britannia was literally calling me fat behind my back. And I weighed probably 135 pounds at the time. And when I was like hopping across the beds for the bed challenge, Britannia, like on camera interview was saying, just watching corn feds fat ass flop across those beds. And I was like, bitch, you are my friend. Like, oh. why would you say that? You know? Oh, that's and brutal so to hear that sucked. back. Like that people were calling me fat and clumsy and things like that. I was like, that really hurt my feelings a lot because oh. yeah, I know, you, you know, you don't expect it. And is that is particularly cruel and, and petty. And <clears throat> the play devil's advocate, I will say just because I, I know how the producers talk to us, you know, when we're getting ready to do our commentary, there is a chance they might have encouraged her to like talk shit about you, you know, but whether or not you decide to, to actually say the things that they encourage you to say that that's on you, but um, meaning Britannia, but um, it's, that's a really funny thing because fast forward 10 years later, girls are literally going to the doctors to get their asses injected so that they can have big fat asses. So I guess maybe you're like a trailblazer. You like influence everybody. <laughs> like, it, like on the one hand, they're like, oh, her like corn fed and her fat ass. But on the back of their mind, like, how do I get an ass like corn fed? <laughs> That's probably what was actually happening. <laughs> That's wow. really funny. No, and it's funny because she's actually very sweet and we would talk and She's a very sweet person. And so I was just really shocked watching it back because my feelings were hurt. And I, like I've said before, I've always stayed true to who I was. Even when I would do like cam interviews, I would never sit and like talk a bunch of garbage about people because it's just not in me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was just very shocking to hear things like that because, you know, the fans of the show are sitting there tearing you apart all the time and calling you fat and ugly and keyboard warriors are like go- coming for you. <laughs> and then to like see other women that you're in that experience with, like I'm so much about women empowerment and, you know, making sure that women support other women. And so like seeing another woman call me fat was hard. That that, that yeah. sucked. I can so. imagine. Yeah, it's got to feel really hurtful. And um, yeah, I'm sorry that you had those experiences, but um, I think overall you, you did come out on top as evident by like you have a ton of fans and a lot of people love you and you were definitely like, not only the winner on Real Chance of Love, but you were definitely one of the fan favorites as well because of how much you weren't like the other girls, because of how much you maintained your integrity and you were very sweet and and it was clear you had like a really big heart. So I think, you know, people can say whatever they want about you, but ultimately that's what the real reality is, you know? So um, so one thing, uh, I didn't talk to Callie about this because she was more interested in um, chance and we just had so much to talk about that we end up running out of time. But I do want to bring this up with you because you actually had a real relationship and real feelings with, um, with real. Uh, how did you handle hearing about his death? I mean, that was just so devastating and so shocking. And, you know, everybody watched chance's journey with his brother as his brother was getting sick and, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. But, you know, when he actually passed, it was, I mean, for me personally, I didn't think it was going to happen that soon. How did you get the news and and how did you handle it? How did you cope with that? Um, ooh, like I'm starting to get teary eyed even thinking about it because, oh, I just feel so bad. Like he had a wife and a child and he, 
was such a good man, such a good man. And like, you know, despite everything that happened between us, like we still talked on social media. Um, when I got married, he congratulated me. Um, he reached out and who I did not know I'd get emotional. Girl, don't make me cry. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> I'm <sorry. laughs> no, it's well, sad. It's, it's um, it, devastating. It's up with each other. And um, we really just wish the best for each other. And we would like each other's stuff. And we would talk to each other over Facebook Messenger. And so it was difficult. I mean, it was definitely emotional for me. And I was, you know, I was married at the time and I would talk to my husband about it. And he's so supportive and he totally understood. And um, even to this day, like I still follow Chance on social media. He follows me like we like each other's stuff. And I think at the end of the day, like we're humans and we're real people and we all experience that. And that's something that, you know, too, like people don't know the connection that you have to reality people that experience the Of Love shows. Um, they don't understand like that connection. Like we all experience that. And so you have like this it's like a piece of your heart, you know? And I don't know. I just, I really thought he was just such a good man. So hearing about that was just, it was really hard. It was, cause that was such a big piece of my life. Of and course. Yeah. I don't know. He had a family and it, like, it's just devastating. And as you said, he, he came across as a really good man. He came across as very sweet and um, just so much, charisma and, you know, animal lover and had a great career and had this great relationship with his brother and a talented musician. And they just had everything going for him. And um, I just keep going back to like, he's such a nice person. So it's, it's always more painful when people like that go at such a early age too in their life. And then for you specifically, yeah, I totally get your sadness because not only did you have that connection with him that was real, that was genuine, but also it was very impactful to your life. So to have somebody that was like that important to this, this pivotal moment of your life that set you on this trajectory to have that person go away. I mean, that's, that's yeah, devastating, heartbreaking. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to anybody who knew real and, and felt a love for him that had to go through the loss of him. It's, it's devastating. Well, so. he lost, but never forgotten because people still to this day, like on his birthday, they like make posts about him and on the anniversary of his death, they make posts about him. And you can tell that he was just genu genuinely loved by everybody. Yeah. So. Oh, well, you know, that's what is great is that through these shows, everyone is able to keep his memory alive. So at least there is that gift in all of this. So, um, well, good deal. So tell me, so shift gears now. Uh, tell me what's going on with you since the show. What's going on now? You, I just can't get over how amazing you look. You look so great. I know you do makeup. And if you're ever in Las Vegas, come please do makeup with me because I'm not a makeup person at all. But I'm a hair person. I'm not a makeup person. But um, but let, tell everybody what you got going on and, and how to find you and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, so after all the shows and everything, I moved back to my hometown because I tried living out in LA and it did not work out for me. Yeah, <laughs> it's... Town. It's a tough city for sure. It is. And so I moved back here and my dad owns an insurance company. I started working there and I, I worked there for 10 years and I had like lost that sparkle. I got married. I had kids and I was just like, what's my purpose? Like, this is not fulfilling me. I need to find something that like gives me drive. And, you know, I wake up and I hit the ground running like yeah. life is short, you know, and so I start, I joined a network marketing company and I know that there's like this whole stigma behind network marketing, like pyramid scheme, this and this and that. But what I didn't know, because I was one of those people, I was like, this will, this is a pyramid scheme. This is that I don't want to be one of those, you know, boss babes. That's like right. copy and pasting <laughs> messages, like join my team, join my team, try right. my product. Like I was not into it, but then I ended up finding this company called Lime Life by Alcone. And it's a makeup and skincare company. And it's been, Alcone itself has been in the industry for decades. So it's pro makeup. Nice. And like celebrity and professional makeup artists have been using it on television runway and um, film for decades. And actually the 
foundation shade porcelain was made specifically for the Star Wars movies, which is really cool. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I guess tell my husband that because he loves Star Wars and anything having to do with Star Wars. So that's really cool. Yeah. So I I found this company and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this as a hobby. This is just a hobby. Like I'm just going to play with makeup and party with my friends and we're just going to have fun. And literally um, three months into it, I I quit my job at my dad's insurance company. I tripled my paycheck and I started running for the top of the company. So I currently now have a team of almost 4,000 women. Wow. Go you. I hold That's a amazing. position that only three other people in our whole company hold. And um, it's it's big. It's really big. So when I started, there was only 4,000 beauty guides in the whole world. And now I have that many just on my team. So wow. it's really exploded. And all it was, was I literally, I'm going to show you this because I brought it. Um, I brought it out. I bought this starter kit for $169. Yeah. And it changed my whole life. Like wow. I make multiple six figures and we just, we have a pending offer on our dream home on the lake. I have three beautiful children and I just retired my husband from construction. That is amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> that is so, so great. I love hearing stories like this. It makes me really happy because just like so many people struggle and so many people people have a hard time. And the fact that um, you just, it sounds to me, you know, what I think you did what, right was exactly what you just said, which is like, we only live once. You know, you got to find a way to do what makes you happy because when you do what makes you happy, it doesn't feel like work and you can work really hard, but it doesn't feel like you're working hard. It just feels like you're doing what what you love to do. So um, I think that's so awesome. And I, I'm happy for you with your your marriage and your kids and like all the career stuff like that. That is like really cool. Um, so what is the best way? Well, actually, first, let me ask you, do you do makeup tutorials? I do. You You do? Okay, good. Yeah, I do makeup tutorials live on my Facebook page. So if anybody wants to come find me, purchase makeup, watch how to do makeup. I also am a mentor and a coach. And so I do a lot of like motivational speaking. I have this really big team. And so I'm always training them on Zooms and Facebook lives. And if anybody's looking for an opportunity to change their life, if they want to get into something, maybe you just want a hobby or maybe you want to find a new career path get a hold of me. I'm on Facebook as Abby Panasuk. Um, I have a public Facebook. And so it's easy to see my videos. Even if we're not friends, you can follow me. I'm also on Instagram as Abby Panasuk. Um, Dark Horse Beauty is kind of like my brand. And so I'm just like the wild pink haired makeup lady now. And I love that. <laughs> so, I'll put, by the way, I'll put all that information in the description of the YouTube. So people, if they, um, Click on that, they'll be able to see it all. So, well, that's awesome. Well, Abby, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and chatting with me. You're like such a delight and you look beautiful. And and um, I love talking to you. You're such good energy and congratulations on everything you have going on. Thank you. And I just have to say, Lacey, like I loved you on the show. I know like they kind of tried to make you out to be the villain. And oh, so no, that was, like- That was my doing too. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put it all but on But I them. love that. Like I love your personality and I, I absolutely love your energy. And you're so different. Like just talking to you, you're so sweet. Oh. And you're so personable. And so I just thank you so much for reaching out to me. This was awesome. And I really hope like we, after COVID and everything, we get to like, spend some time together in person. (laughs) I would love that. I would absolutely love that. And thank you for all your kind words. That's really sweet of you. And yeah, let's definitely stay in touch for sure. I'm I'm glad that we got to meet. I'm sorry it took so long, but um, but yeah, let's stay in touch. Yes, let's do it. All right, girl. I'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. That was so great. What an amazing, beautiful, sweet, and like just great energy woman Abby is. I'm, I'm so lucky to have such cool people come onto the podcast. Anyway, um, thank you guys once again for watching. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for being so supportive. And if you enjoy the podcast, make sure to click the, the thumbs up and uh, make sure to subscribe because we've got some really, really great guests coming up. In fact, you guys are going to be really, really happy about this. Safari, you guys know Safari, Flavor of Love, Charm School, Isle of Money. She's going to be our guest next Monday. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to have her on. It's going to be great. And uh, also, if you guys enjoy this podcast, I invite you to become a contributor. Your money goes into helping keep this podcast going. So definitely, you can show your support that way. And you'll get lots of really cool rewards. One of the things that I'm offering is to see the entire Rock of Love 
all the reaction videos, season one. You're basically watching Rock of Love along with me. I will send you the whole entire season for a one-time fee of $25. You can pay with um, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, whatever is easy for you. Just go to the website, talkoflove.net and click on reaction videos. You can also become a monthly contributor, which means you get monthly rewards. You get to do Skype chats with me. You get uh, shout outs. You also get reaction videos to some of the other seasons like Charm School. After that, we'll probably be getting into I Love Money, all kinds of good stuff. But yeah, go check out that on the website as well. Just go to talkoflove.net slash contribute. Become a contributor. See what all kinds of rewards are being offered. You can also click on shop and get some t-shirts from Talk of Love, A-list celebrity. Don't threaten me with a good time. We got like, a lot of really great t-shirts. So go check that out. And um, I've got a lot of uh, good information in the description as well as far as everyone's Instagram account, all that good stuff where you can find us online. Go check that out in the description on YouTube. Thank you guys so, so much. And I am enjoying getting to bring you this content every week. Thank you for continuing to be a part of it. Love you guys. And we'll see you next Monday. Don't threaten me with a good time. Bye guys.